Asset managers often consider two primary time horizons in their asset allocation strategies. The Strategic Asset Allocation, SAA, with a very long-term perspective, typically 10 years, and the Tactical Asset Allocation, TAA, with a shorter time horizon ranging from one month to one year. However, a crucial element seems to be missing, the medium-term time horizon, one to three years, even if an investment strategy performs well in the short run and long run, a drawdown over a two to three year period could result in cumulative negative performances over this period, dissatisfying clients and potentially leading them to withdraw their investments. Recognizing this gap, we advocate for the inclusion of medium term asset allocation, MTAA, in the overall strategy. In addition, a multi-horizon approach offers the advantage of aligning financial and economic indicators with the targeted forecasting period. The SAA considers long-term risk premier and structural economic indicators. The MTAA is guided by valuation indicators and cyclical economic indicators. The TAA involves factors like price momentum, economic momentum, technical analysis, sentiment, and fundamental metrics. Following discussions with the CIO, it became clear that simplicity is key to the solution. The CIO seeks a model that not only reveals the drivers of asset prices in the medium run, but also facilitates discussions within the investment committee. This model should enable the CIO to input various scenarios on the macroeconomic cycle and assess their impact on asset class preferences. Folks, I can sense that some of you might be feeling a bit bored or sleepy. Let's inject some fun into the conversation and draw an analogy. Just as different climates determine the habitat of specific animals, understanding financial regimes allows us to determine which asset classes are likely to perform better or worse. Let's play the picture matching game. I show you three pictures. A dry and warm desert, a cold and icy landscape, a rainforest, and I present you with three animals, a bear, a camel, a monkey. And then I ask you to associate each animal with the corresponding picture, essentially telling me which animal lives in which climate. You know that the monkey lives in the rainforest, that the bear lives in the Iceland, and that the camel lives in the desert. The analogy applies to asset classes, by identifying and distinguishing among financial regimes, we can determine the appropriate asset classes to choose and those to avoid. Just as climates are determined by meteorological indicators, financial regimes are shaped by valuations and macroeconomic cycles. Moving beyond mere returns, the CIO is keen on understanding the behavior of asset classes. Like fund pickers who use various metrics to characterize a fund's behavior, we consider not only returns, but also assess returns relative to factors like max drawdown, downside risk, denominator of the Sortino ratio, and volatility, denominator of the Sharp ratio, to characterize the behavior of asset classes. However, there's a challenge in this exercise as the CIO's investment universe is broader than a traditional multi-asset universe covering 17 asset classes, including alternative assets. To ensure sufficient coverage of economic cycles, data since the early 70s is incorporated, necessitating the use of proxies for several asset classes to extend their history. For example, the Farmer and French small cap factor is employed to extend the history of private equity, supplemented by a beta factor and an illiquidity premium. Infrastructure is proxied by a combination of the transportation industry and the utility sector. In this project, we opted for the use of parsimonious or pruned decision trees as a solution. Decision trees allow for non-linear relationships and by being parsimonious, we avoid overfitting and maintain prediction power. They are straightforward to explain akin to a recipe book that blends valuation criteria with assumptions on macroeconomic variables to ascertain the most likely outcome, in our case, the preferred asset classes. 
This exercise enables us to identify the most crucial factors, looking at what we call feature importance in the technical jargon for the medium-term asset allocation, MTAA, and streamline variables along the way. We commenced with 450 indicators, each with over 50 years of historical data. These indicators include absolute valuations of asset classes, cross-asset relative valuations, and macroeconomic variables categorized into four families. Inflation-related variables, economic growth-related variables, credit or leverage cycle-related variables, and liquidity-related variables encompassing both traditional and unconventional monetary policy, as well as FX appreciation or depreciation. The initial findings indicate that the macroeconomic cycle explains two-third of financial regimes and valuations account for one-third. Liquidity emerges as the predominant macroeconomic factor, followed by the credit and leverage cycle and economic growth. Notably, cross-asset valuations prove to be more influential than individual asset class valuations. From the initial pool of 454 indicators, we successfully eliminate 412 variables as the parsimonious trees retain 42 variables to elucidate the relative behavior of 17 asset classes. Our client asked, but how often do families of indicators appear across the trees for the various asset classes? To address this inquiry, we now explore the significance of indicators this time focusing on their frequency within the final tree. The analysis reveals that variables associated with liquidity regimes are overwhelmingly the most significant factors in determining financial regimes, frequently appearing at the first or second level of the decision tree. While I cannot divulge more details of the proprietary recipe, I can share some of the notable results. Were you aware that event-driven hedge funds are advisable in economic regimes characterized by robust GDP growth and positive credit impulse? This insight makes sense, but having empirical proof over a long-term period is even more reassuring, especially before making investment decisions. Did you know that U.S. equities are generally favorable during early or mid-cycle phases they are a buy when valuations are not in bubble territory the USD is slightly appreciating and global excess liquidity is expanding. Conversely, it's prudent to steer clear of US equities during US economic recessions and global liquidity contractions or when economic growth is insufficient to counterbalance inflation and mitigate excessive valuations. This was precisely the scenario we encountered at the beginning of 2022, do you recall? Consequently, in our 22 outlook, we recommended adopting a short position on U.S. equities, particularly in the technology and consumer discretionary sectors where valuations were exceptionally high. I trust you found this short video interesting and enjoyable. Thank you for listening. As 2019 draws to a close, growth in the U.S. is be positive for the 10th year in a row, which is the longest continuous period of expansion recorded since the mid-19th century. Economist estimates that recession is unlikely in 2020 in the U.S. However, the chief investment officer wishes to challenge this perspective and has tasked us with developing a quantitative model to compare our results with their views. Over the period going from 2009 to 2019, the unusual length of the cycle has regularly instilled fear of an imminent recession among many doomsayers. Their rationale is based on a simple premise. The longer the period of expansion continues, the higher the risk of it ending. This logic is flawed, however, as Janet Yellen highlighted a few years ago when she stated that expansions do not die of old age. During the year 2019, however, fears of a recession in the U.S. have been fueled not only by the risk of the cycle running out of steam, but also exacerbated by trade tensions, coupled with a slowdown in economic activity in China and the rest of the world, 
amid heightened geopolitical uncertainties. These persistent threats combined with fresh risks arising and the exceptionally long cycle were highly likely to revive fears of a recession during 2020. Although traditional macroeconomic analysis pinpointed sources of instability, including widening imbalances and asset price bubbles, and also highlighted potential shocks which could tip economies into recession, such as a trade war or restrictive monetary policies, it nonetheless provided no objective gauge of the risk of recession. To remedy this situation, we have developed several machine learning models. Traditionally, econometricians use probit-type models in order to predict recessions. Probit models, which are derived from linear regression models, are used to assess binary variables. These types of model are used to estimate the probability of one of two different events occurring. In this case, the probability of whether a recession will occur over a given time frame or not. These models have nonetheless been proven to harbor a major default as models with equivalent statistical properties over past periods can provide recession probability forecasts which differ greatly. The choice of predictive variables plays a key role and also strongly biases forecasts. Estimations from three probit models based primarily on yield curve steepness illustrate this inherent default. Whereas in the past, the yield curve slope, real short-term rates and monetary policy tightness also proved to be reliable indicators of an imminent recession in the US, signals over the past few years have diverged. Given the difficulty in selecting the correct model, choosing one of these predictor variables, which all adopt similar trends, there is a danger of making an erroneous assessment of the risk of a recession. In order to remedy this difficulty, more sophisticated and more reliable methods can be used. We've used two methods belonging to a subset of artificial intelligence models called ensemble of machine learning models. Two principles underpin the selected machine learning algorithms applying the practice makes perfect approach. In other words, there are no assumed certainties and applying these models to a broad variety of sample improves them and enhances their predictive ability. Adopting the wisdom of crowds or collective intelligence approach, a crowd's diverse, independent and aggregated opinions as opposed to the discretionary choices of one single opinion are collectively more intelligent than any of the component individual. Transposed onto our case study, the wisdom of crowds approach involves privileging aggregated information provided by a multitude of models over information from any one particular model. In other words, there is no point in seeking the best model from the past as there is no guarantee that it will remain superior in the future. It is therefore better to combine a widely diversified range of models in order to provide more reliable average information. The following presentation provides a brief descriptions of the two machine learning models we have used and outlines the results of the two models we have implemented. These models have been trained using a sample of around 100 leading economic and financial indicators features which may predict the onset of a recession within a time horizon of 12 months. The first machine learning model we have used is a Bayesian averaging of probit models. This method is based on the estimates provided by several hundred thousand of probit models combining up to four explanatory variables, features, of which only around 10,000 models are retained as they are deemed sensible from an economic point of view in the same way as a surgeon has to make a decision based on the interpretation of an x-ray on the eve of a delicate operation, the models are assessed, taking into account uncertainties associated with new circumstances arising. In other words, each model is assessed in probabilistic terms. 
In applying Bayes' rules, the combination of models provides a recession probability founded on a rationale which also includes uncertainties. The second machine learning model we've used is called Random Forest. The Random Forest method is based on a random collection of decision trees, which split the original sample of zeros and ones, no recession over the next 12 months, recession over the next 12 months, based upon the states of observed macro and financial variables, the features, into more homogenous samples of zeros and ones, higher likelihood of either no recession or a recession. Unlike probit models, decision trees are non-parametric methods which take greater interaction complexity between variables, features, into account. Their use has nonetheless traditionally been restricted due to their instability. Any slight modification in data sample leads to highly different decision trees and therefore generates very different predictions. The combination of the wisdom of crowds theme with progress in computing power and speed, particularly since the early 2000s, has led to the emergence of an algorithm which remedies this issue, namely random forests. As its name would imply, this approach draws on the aggregate values of a multitude of decision trees, an entire forest, rather than a single tree structure in order to improve prediction power. Prediction power is also improved by implementing an algorithmic learning process across sub-periods. This is the practice makes perfect aspect and reconciling predictions with observed reality outside of the learning periods in October 2019 using macroeconomic and financial data available at that date. The two models ascribed a very low probability of a recession occurring in the US in the next 12 months. The Bayesian averaging result, blue curve, predicted less than 20% probability of a recession occurring in 2020. The result provided by random forests, orange curve, was even clearer with assigned a probability of less than 10%. The quantitative analysis that we have developed therefore substantiated the view held by the economists. In October 2019, we concluded that the US economy would be unlikely to tip into a recession in 2020. You might be curious about whether the machine learning models were capable of detecting the onset of the COVID-induced recession. And if they were, when did they do so? Upon rerunning our models at the end of December 2019, we observed the probabilities surging to 30% and increasing to 40% by the end of January 2020. Half a year prior to the official NBER announcement, the machine learning models successfully identified a recession in the US. Without the emergence of COVID-19, a recession in the US was unlikely to occur in 2020. However, by inputting timely data into the machine learning models, our CIO was able to receive an early recession signal as early as the beginning of 2020, a few months before the NBER officially declared the US to be in a recession. Thank you for listening.